Okay, awesome. So as I talked about, um, again, just with the start of the race season, we wanted to um, talk through our specific racing zones. These are going to be specific to you. Um, every athlete, depending on their experience racing, on their experience just with fitness overall, is going to vary a little bit. Um, but again, this kind of can allow you and your coach to work to define what those zones will be to dial in your overall race efforts. So as we start looking at the different race distances, um, again, the shorter the distance, the more intense we're going to be going. We won't be out on the course as long. So our effort level is going to be a little bit higher. Your 90% to 100% is going to be different than maybe a training partner's or somebody else's. So again, that's something to keep in mind. But typically for a sprint, you're going hard and fast. Um, and then for Olympic, it's a little bit more scaled back, 70.3, a little bit more scaled back from there. And then an Ironman, again, since it's such a long day, um, we're going to be much more conservative there as well. So to kick us off, I'm going to have Coach Katie. She's going to talk through our sprint racing zones and what you can expect for that distance. Hey, guys. Um, yes, sprint uh, triathlons are so much fun. I love them. Um, I honestly, when I race them, sometimes I don't even use my watch because, um, one thing that Natasha always tells me with sprints, I mean, you, every second counts. And so even just like fiddling with your watch in transition to go, like, you don't mean to, but to click it for swim and you end up looking at it and it gets in your head and then click it over for bike and click it over for run. Um, sometimes it's fun to just race without anything and just go all out and find that red line and push it and see how you feel and see how recovery goes. So sprint um, distances are really good and fun for that. Um, so when you are getting in the water for your sprint distance, um, really you should kind of know the pace that you're wanting to hit. You're working on that in the pool. So you're knowing what it feels like to push those limits um, what you can hold for that duration. Again, some of these distances are different depending on the race. Um, like I know some sprints are, you know, 500 meters, some are 400 meters. So just be aware of what your sprint distance is. So you know how that feels in the pool and how that would translate to open water. Um, but you're really getting in and you are settling in really quick. If you can get on people's feet, that's great. Um, the great thing about a sprint is you usually can see the last buoy. Like you usually can see that finish line. Um, and so it's very easy to cite for that, uh, which which then you can it helps you just go a little bit faster in the water when you can see that finish line. Um, one thing I would recommend getting in for a sprint is your adrenaline is definitely going to be even higher because you know you're going to be pushing it. Be really careful getting in. Um, one thing we talked about at camp is make sure that you start your breathing early. Don't go like five or six strokes and then start breathing because then you're automatically in that oxygen deficit. And then that's the whole rest of the race. You're pushing those levels. And so you're already starting off low. So just keep that in mind. Still remember the blowing out of the breath and taking the breath early in your strokes for that sprint. Um, then uh, when you get out, you get on your bike. This is fun. You just go by feel, like just push the whole time. See what it feels like to push, play with the gears, make sure there's constant tension on those pedals. Um, and that it's just a really fun race to um, just see what you can do, what efforts you can push for the short amount of time. Um, and then you get off, you go for the run. Um, usually sprints are about a 5K, which we all kind of, when we do our testing and we do 5K testing, you should kind of know what that pacing feels like. Um, and again, like just red line, like go do what you can do, um, get out there. I usually, whenever I do it, I'll maybe stop at one aid station. If I'm really pushing and I can make it without it, maybe I don't. And I just have my hand held and I just go for it because every single second counts in that sprint. Um, and then you're really pushing that last half mile should hurt. Like you're pushing super hard. Your, your quads are screaming and you see that finish line and you go for it. So this is really just about getting in there, seeing what you can do at like what your red line feels like and finishing strong throughout the day. So that's, that's what makes sprint so fun is you just get to get out there and have a really good time. And it's just you versus you. Awesome. Thank you. So now we're going up in distance Olympic and coach McKenzie is going to give us some tips for pacing here. Awesome. So this is arguably one of the toughest distances in triathlon just because of the pacing and the distance that you're going to do for the Olympic distance. So, and another 
And since with the swim, bike and run, so the swim is typically about 1500 meters, which is only 400 meters shy of a half Ironman swim. So the swim is really important because it's longer in totality based on the other triathlon distances. So this swim really needs to be a really hard and fast swim. So you want to get in, start strong, and then settle in once you find a really good pace or a really good group that you're a part of. So getting in the swim and starting off hard is very helpful for this Olympic distance just because of the time within the entire um, race of the Olympic with the distances. So swim, you want to be about 90% effort um, all throughout the Olympic distance. We want to be between 85 and 95% of our threshold effort. And so the time is typically between two and three hours, which staying at about 95%, as you can imagine, of your threshold effort is a very difficult thing to do. So this is typically a zone four type of race. Um, and so when you think about 95% uh, of your threshold, your typically your threshold is what you can maintain for about an hour and still stay, stay aerobic. So each discipline is right about right at that one hour mark. So you really can go up to 95% and be able to hold steady with that throughout the entire race. But as you can imagine, that's a very difficult thing to do. So making sure you're swimming strong, you're fueling really well on the bike still, even at the shorter distance to be able to get off and run right at that zone four right at that 95%, 90 to 95% of your threshold. Um, it's a it's a difficult race. And as Katie mentioned in the sprint, seconds matter here. So it is a lot of, are you going to wear socks or not? Are you going to hop on your bike? Like there are different techniques in the Olympic distance that can really translate to um, increasing your speed because at this point, transitions, the seconds matter, not minutes. It's really comes down to seconds in this race. So, and the, unlike the sprint, you kind of go in and you're, you're redlining this entire bit. You still need a little bit of a pacing strategy for this Olympic in order to maintain that 90, 95% for the entire race. So I like to tell my athletes to go hard out in the swim, get on the bike, find a really good zone, um, check your heart rate monitor or your power. You can go up to 95% of your FTP as well and really find a really good place. That second loop or the second back half of the bike, I tell them to really to, to go hard on the second loop. And same thing for the run. About halfway through the run, that first mile should be really settling in, but it's, in a, it's a great start to um, finding your that zone four. And then that second half of that run, you are just going as hard as you can and leaving it all out there. So I love the Olympic distance. And again, very proud of all those athletes who were out in clash today. That was a, a really hot and humid day and Olympic distance, even a little bit further. So that's the Olympic. Awesome. Thank you. And as y'all have questions related to this, um, to any of the distances or pacing or anything like that, um, definitely drop them in the chat and we'll tackle those at the end as well. <laughs> Um, coach Nick, I'm going to hand it over to you and we're going to talk about 70.3s. Awesome. So as McKenzie talked about with the distance at the Olympic being much more critical, the 70.3 swim is not that much farther, but for most people, a 70.3 takes twice as long as an Olympic or international distance race. So for that reason, we're gonna be a little bit more conservative on the swim. If you haven't swim, swam a lot of open water, the first thing you're gonna notice is that your paces are much slower in open water than they are in the pool. And that's for two reasons. The first is it takes a lot of um, sighting and a lot of ability to keep in good body position while sighting and swim a straight line. Uh, but the second and more important issue is the fastest you are in a pool is when you push off the wall and there are no walls in open water. So you're gonna lose eight to 10% of your speed just because every 25 yards or 25 meters, you're not pushing off the wall. So if you're a beginner swimmer, 
uh, or this is your first 70.3 or the first time swimming a lot of open water, most likely you're going to be at an aerobic level, very controlled. And the way I like to think about this is if you, most all of us do four by 50 descends as part of our warm up with the MVDM swims. And so the first one's super easy. The second one's a little bit faster. The third one of those descends should be right at threshold. And the fourth is a very strong kind of all out type effort. So if you're a beginner swimmer, it should be about the same as your second descend. If you're an experienced athlete who's going to swim up to about 80% of your swim speed, then that's going to be right under that threshold, right at the third of those four threshold intervals that we do to kind of start out. And then when you get on the bike, it's much the same. So when we test the, the cyclists for bike, we test FTP and we also test your aerobic um, amount that you can hold. And most people can hold between 65 and 72, 75% of their threshold FTP on the bike at an aerobic state. And so while that for a lot of people is more of 140.6 pace, uh, for beginner triathletes that are doing their first 70.3 or not as experienced with racing, that's a really good level to kind of start and do your first 70.3 bike. Those that are more conditioned athletes or being more aggressive, perhaps wanting to qualify for worlds, you're going to bike between 80 to an 85 percent of FTP with experienced athletes as elites and even some pros that will bike almost up to 90 percent. And when you come off the run, a lot of people find a lot more benefit on a 70.3 running by heart rate rather than running by pace. And the reason for that is quite simply, you're going to if you look at your half marathon standalone pace, most half marathons are run at 6, 630, 7 a.m. in the morning. It's 45 to 60 degrees. When you get off of a bike after four hours of racing, it's going to be 11, 1130. You're probably going to be in temperatures in the upper 70s to mid 80s. A lot of the 70.3s are April through September, hotter time of the year. So you're going to have an effect of the heat, especially if you're not a heat conditioned athlete. So, you know, being five to seven percent slower than that 70.3 is a good starting point. But it's also really good to kind of think about 80 to 82 percent of your uh, max heart rate is a really good place to kind of settle in and do the run, um, especially, you know, the start of the run and the start of the bike in a 70.3 is much more critical that first five minutes to keep your heart rate down and kind of settle in and then you can kind of build from there. So we usually tell people in a 70.3, start conservatively for the first mile, increase your heart rate a little bit to a sustainable amount for the first 10. And when you hit mile 10, you can go as hard as you want to, to bring it home. So. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. And now, Coach Harrell, we're going to talk about 140.6. Hello. Okay, everybody. So um, as far as the distances go, obviously Ironman is going to be the farthest distance triathlon that we're going to do on the scale of triathlons that we're looking at today. Um, and even though it is twice the distance of the 70.3 distance, it is more than twice the effort. Where we're going to make mistakes in this race, they're going to be most exposed in our end results. So you, you can get away with mistakes on the shorter distance races, especially sprint distance or even Olympic. But in an Ironman distance race, if you make mistakes, they are going to reach up and, and, and bite you. So I always say to err on the conservative side of your pacing strategies, especially early in the race. OK, that's one way to look at it. We also want to look at this distance as um, as a distance that we really need to stay under an effort that we can control our nutritional intake. OK, so you will hear from a lot of people who have done an Ironman distance race that they fumbled their nutrition and they had trouble with their nutrition. And a lot of times that is either a a pacing strategy that got pacing strategy that got a little too rich, a little too early in an effort or they just got behind on the timing of when they were going to take in their nutrition. So you don't want to be trying to make up for a lack of nutrition strategy early in these in this race, um, especially on the bike. So we want to make sure that our effort is staying conservative enough to where we can get that nutrition in and get it easily in, especially on the bike, okay? On the pacing strategies, we have these listed between 65 and 80% of FTP on the bike. That's high zone two, low zone three type heart rate. And then on the run, we also want to look at that high zone two, low zone three heart rate. And 70% is kind of the idea of where you want to start from. Some of us maybe want to go a little bit below 70% of those threshold efforts, threshold meaning your FTP or your threshold heart rate, what you can do for one hour. Some of us may race a little more aggressive and go a little bit above 70%. 
maybe even up a little bit above 75% of those numbers, okay? So it's a pretty wide range there. For most of us, the best pacing strategies within the swim alone, within the bike alone, and within the run alone are going to be to start on the lower end of those averages, right? And then let the effort come to you, right? Mm -hmm. In a sprint distance race or an Olympic distance race, you can really take it to the race. You can bring the hard to the race. In an Ironman distance race, I always say, let the hard come to you. It will come. Be patient. Don't try to take the hard to the race. So starting within each discipline at a little bit of a lower end of where you want your effort to be in the swim at the start of the swim in the bike at the start of the bike and in the run at the start of the run. I always like to say that the first 500 meters of the swim should be your slowest 500 meter section, dependent on the course, right? As long as you're not swimming against a current at the very end of the swim, all those variables controlled. The first 500 meters of the swim should be the slowest, right? You're getting into your rhythm. You're letting that hard come to you towards the end of the 2.4 mile swim, okay? Same thing on the bike. The first 15 miles or 20 miles of the bike should be the slowest or easiest part of the whole entire bike. You want to find that rhythm through the middle section and then let the hard come to you. Once you get to that 90, 100 mile mark, it's going to be hard. Okay. Uh, same thing on the run. You're gathering yourself early in the run, the first few miles, first 5K or so, you're trying to get some nutrition in, and that should be your easiest, smoothest part of the run. Unless you are an aggressive racer, which in any three of these disciplines, you need to either bridge a gap to a pack or you're trying to make a move within the race as if you are racing other people. But if you're not racing other people in your age group or in the elite field, then just be conservative and let the hard come to you. Start easier within each discipline and let the let the, the rhythm come and then make it hard towards the end. Okay. So key is to be able to keep your heart rate or your effort low enough to where you can get all the nutrition in that you need to get. All right. Start smooth and relaxed at the beginning of the swim, at the beginning of the bike and the beginning of the run. Right. If you're looking at hard numbers, you want to be somewhere around 70 percent. If you're a beginner Ironman distance triathlete, maybe even a little bit below that. Those who are more experienced, who um, are racing the race can go a little more aggressive than those things. All right. And then just let the race come to you. The pace should never feel like it's too hard. If it feels like it's too hard at any point in time in the Ironman, then you're probably cooked, right? I had a coach many years ago who, who I'd always say, um, and, it, and if you've done an Ironman race, this will resonate with you. You'll, you'll kind of get it. You'll understand. And it was very a uh, facetious statement, but he would always say, if it feels like it's too easy, then just slow down a little bit, right? It's an Ironman. It's going to get hard. Let the race come to you, get your nutrition in and be conservative, especially on the first one. Yeah. Awesome. And one thing I would add, especially with really all of these distances is knowing the course, um, especially if you're doing a really hilly course, if you're doing an out and back where there's typically like a headwind that can also play into, you know, okay, I'm going to be conservative until I get to the climbs, or I'm going to be conservative until I know that headwind's coming um, and saving that energy so that you have the energy for the moments that you need to have those big pushes. Um, there's a lot of value in just looking at the course map, looking at all of those things and having that conversation with your coach, just so um, you can take that into consideration on the day as well. So the last thing to talk about, um, you'll notice all everyone pretty much kind of called out pacing by heart rate. And that's one thing that um, we really recommend. Heart rate is really your internal guide. It's your guide as it relates to fueling. It's your guide as it relates to heat. It's a guide as it relates to your pacing. And so using that um, as your guide on the day can help you troubleshoot. It can also help kind of be your, your monitor um, as if you're going too hard, if you're going too conservative, you're fueling and all of that. So um, again, a lot of times, whatever your heart rate is on the bike, and this is going to apply really to all three of them, especially in the longer distances, that's going to be the same heart rate that you try to hold on the run. As we get into the longer distances, especially Ironman, as fatigue sets in, it's not uncommon for your heart rate to actually go down. 
And so staying on top of that with your nutrition can um, help us keep it up. Once it goes down, it can be hard to get it back up. And so a lot of that has to do with fatigue. A lot of that has to do with hydration. And so just making sure that we're staying on top of it. You don't want it to drift too far as the race goes on. Um, so again, if your heart rate's too high, this could be related to dehydration. It also can be related to heat. Um, so that's whenever we've talked about, you know, dumping water on your head, holding ice, you know, having those things prepared in your pocket um, so that if it does start happening, you know what to do in that moment. Um, again, if your heart rate's too low, this could be related to under fueling. Maybe you need caffeine, you need some Coke, you need some sugar to help get your heart rate back up. It also can be related to being too conservative. Um, everyone kind of talked about, you know, just taking those few minutes to settle in. Um, and that's especially important in the longer distances. And so um, even if your heart rate's too low for a moment, that's okay because you don't want it to spike too early, too, too fast. Um, and so again, allowing that to be your guide. And then again, if your heart rate's too high, it could be because we're going out too fast. Again, the hydration that we talked about. So just understanding um, and using that as a tool to your benefit. If sometimes power numbers maybe aren't there, this could be your, you don't have power um, or some a battery died, you know, whatever the case is, knowing, okay, now I'm going to lean on heart rate. If you don't have heart rate, then I'm going to lean on effort and just knowing what that effort feels like. Um, and now's the time for us to kind of start identifying that. So just to kind of wrap it up, um, kind of as we prefaced in the beginning, effort ranges and exact paces, they're ultimately going to de be dependent on you, your experience as an athlete, your experience in racing. Um, but again, all of this is guide that we can use, um, especially within this month as we really start our seasons and we're doing race specific work. Um, thinking about what does this effort feel like? You know, what does this um, watt feel like? What does this heart rate feel like? And then using that to define what your zones will be as you go into the start of your race season. Any questions? Any other coaches that are on? Did we miss anything that y'all want to add to that? Awesome. Quiet group. Well, Six minutes early. Um, I hope that y'all have a great weekend. Make it a great week. Um, hang on, we have one question come in. Uh, for a full especially, but also with other distances, if it seems smooth during the swim and the bike, are you just a terrible runner? Or is that just when the heart comes to me? Um, everyone is definitely going to have uh, their distance that maybe feels a little bit easier. Um, Andrew, I'll let you lean on your coach for that <laughs> answer. But um, I think it kind of goes back in all seriousness to fueling as well into nutrition. If you don't feel that well on the bike, you're going to pay for it on the run. And then you are in a deficit and it's really hard to get caught back up to that. And so that's one thing, Andrew, that you can focus on just to kind of help set yourself up for success um, whenever you do get on the run. Um, is the person... Let me, let, uh, oh, go Ashton, ahead. Ashton, yeah. let me add a little something to that. That's yeah. actually a pretty good question to talk about, Andrew, because sometimes when we get to the start line of an Ironman distance race, maybe we have some kind of mechanical issue or something with our run that is giving us a problem. Um, it can be a whole list of many things. And then you just kind of get put into the bucket of, hey, the run is what it is. I'm going to have to do a walk run or, uh, you know, I'm getting through this and I have a little bit of an injury, so I don't know what the run is going to bring me. In those cases, if you are an athlete who is very good on the bike, hey, you may want to increase that effort on the bike because – you're not planning to be able to keep that heart rate up really high for a really good performance on the run anyway. So why not put a few more, uh, you know, eggs into the bike basket, get a little bit of time dialed down there instead of going 70, 75%, maybe you go 75 to 80% on the bike because your strategy from the get-go is I'm going to have to do a little bit of a walk jog and my heart rate's going to be lower on the run than what it was on the bike anyway. So if that's the case, maybe a little bit of a more aggressive bike strategy would be, would suit you best for the best overall time that you could get. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then Sam, if I'm reading your, your, your question correctly, I assume you're asking is really your effort of a run during the try the same effort as a 
run race standalone. Um, not necessarily. Um, with a triathlon, it's it's a little different because you will have just biked and swam before. Um, whenever you're doing a standalone race, you don't have that fatigue before going in. So there's going to be some differences there. Um, depending on the distance, it's going to be similar to a 5k. Obviously you're going to be going much harder at a much higher effort, um, than you are for a marathon. Um, and so that's where we still do 5k test, or you'll do, you know, your threshold test and identify what those pacing zones ideally will be for whatever distance you're doing, um, for your standalone race versus coming off of the bike, um, in a triathlon. Awesome guys. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, y'all have a great week. We'll see you next week. Have a good one.